I have a, a few questions for for our our our, our panelists. Um, and I'll I'll begin with with the one person I'm most comfortable with, and that's you and Bridget. Um, you are the head and leader, or one of the three or four most. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You are, as I said. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, I was just uh, addressing my question to A B. You are the leader and, and head of one of the most of the most important uh, development organizations working on children's issues. My first question to you, and Bridget, is how much of a difference do you think international development organizations like you have made in the lives, what kind of a difference do you think they have made in the lives of children here uh, in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. Button. Yes, here we go. Um, thanks a lot. And, and let me just um, thank you for uh, your kind welcome and, and words and your kind words to me. You know, Plan International in 2018 alone reached 32 million children across the world. Um, that's in programs in, in about uh, 55 countries. Um, here in Africa, we work in 26 countries. Um, and <laughs> measuring impact, as you know, is incredibly difficult. We can, measure, we, we can measure output. But we know that in every country where Plan International works, we work not only to ensure that girls and boys go to school, that they build leadership skills, work, skills for life, um, that they, they live a healthy life, that they're protected from violence, um, and that they, they start off their life well. We increasingly, and this is where I'm, I, I wanted to go, we increasingly work not just to change the individual child's life, but to actually change the conditions under which um, they can thrive. Um, and when it comes to the girl child, which has over the last 10 years become an increasing focus for the organization, we know that changing the life of the individual girl is good, but if we don't actually change the structures, the beliefs, the systems, the laws, um, in each country in which we work, with partners, with government, with, with anybody that cares for the same things we care, um, we won't actually be building a lasting impact. You know, so I love meeting the children, the, the girls and boys that we work with. We have lots of evidence that shows that girls that have been, but girls and boys that have been benefiting from, from plans programs uh, thrive, take on leadership, uh, roles, uh, become accomplished um, adults. Plan International has existed for 80 years. We're one of the few that can do longitudinal studies so we can follow the children into adulthood. So we can measure this. But as a, as a human rights activist, as a development professional, I will never be satisfied until I see the deep systemic change in each and every country that will allow for that deep sustainability. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. That was good, that was really good. You know, the, the, the point you made that uh, we should try to make a change not only in the lives of the individual child, but we should also try to look at the conditions that lead to child deprivation. And I think that is the most sustainable way of going about it. Okay, let me ask you another question. Now, as to the best of my knowledge, and historically, Plan International was something like a child sponsoring organization, a kind of fostering program. What in the world are you doing here now, writing reports or helping the preparation of reports? Yeah, we've come a, we've come a long way. Um, just just for those that those that might not know, 
just a teeny little bit about Plan International's history. Um, and it's actually not that far away when you look at the essence. Plan International was started during the Spanish Civil War um, on the, the base premise that children that are going through war um, will always be left behind. They will always drop out of education. They will lose opportunities. And particularly, as we know today, the girl child will suffer even more than, than, than the boys. So in, in, we were founded in 1932. And at the heart of our essence, we still have this deep desire um, to make sure that we're impacting the most vulnerable children around the world. So while a, a, an organization that supports writing these types of reports is not the same as the one that was started in 1932, that is still at the core. The other thing that has impacted us a lot very recently, um, we, for the last, since the, uh, since the adoption of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which we also helped drive 30 years ago, um, we've seen many shifts in, in our programs. Um, when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted, we took a really hard look at ourselves because the Sustainable Development Goals um, are a truly transformative agenda. And if every single one of us keeps doing exactly the same, even the good same that we're doing, it's not going to be enough. So every single organization, institution, donor, government, et cetera, will need to do something different. And we looked at ourselves and we said, what's the best thing we can do? So we, we set upon, we, we said we don't want to be a child rights organization amongst the many other child rights organizations. We want to be the organization and today the only organization that works squarely in the intersection between the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention um, on Eliminating All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So, so we are today the world's largest girls' rights organization because, as you will see from the report, as well as many other reports, the girl child is the one that always gets left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. But do reports matter at all? Well, the report, this report will not matter at all if it stays on the shelf. The only way to make it matter is to break it down into individual action um, in every single country that, is, uh, that has been reviewed by this, by this report, and that is across the African continent. So we, this, this launch today is you know, just one of many, many, many steps that we will be pursuing uh, with this report. We will be obviously taking it to the AU, discussing it with member states there, to embassies um, here in Addis, but also to every single country, with country briefs for each country, looking at the individual policies that uh, are discriminatory, working with governments, working with activists, working with children themselves, to make sure that the policies um, are changed in all the countries where we have an ability to affect an impact. Thank you very much. I think she deserves an applause, don't you think? Yes. Let me go to my Dutch friend, the Dutch Deputy Ambassador. I, I told you that the Dutch are my good luck. Almost every project that I under to this, they financed it. So I'm glad you're here. Now tell me, um, you belong to one of those countries that, is, uh, that has been really path-breaking in terms of gender equality, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say so? Uh, but could you sort of share with us what the European experience has been in terms of where you were and where you are now and where we might be in the future? Thank you, Dr. Professor of As Asefa. Asefa. Um, Asefa. I feel Asefa. Asefa. Asefa, yes, correct? Professor of As Asefa. Thank you very much for giving me the floor, Professor. And thank you for inviting me to this panel, which I'm honored to be in. The Dutch, as promoters of equal rights, um, it has not been always the case. And 60 years ago, the situation was quite different. But uh, through societal change, and through also uh, action of women themselves, uh, society has changed. 
to a more egalitarian society where women and men enjoy equal rights has changed. It was a path that has taken as well, starting from women's voting rights in the beginning of the 19th century, no, 20th century, until now, where we are still not having a female prime minister, but at least we do have seen a lot of progress in women and women's rights. To talk about girls' rights, I guess it started first with education and curriculum development at schools. Access to education, access to all parts of education and also the curriculum, which also teaches children equality between men and women is key for, uh, for, uh, for in the society where women, men and women are equal. We've gone to a long period of changing our education system, but things have been in place. Another part which I can say that is well, a prime example, and I guess it's in the Netherlands in 2011, we started a youth ombudsman, especially uh, a person delegated for rights of children everywhere in the country. If rules and regulations or behavior of governments, of private institutes, affects children's rights, they can go to the ombudsman and he can start to investigate and amend rules and regulations. A very important institute, and I would like that other countries should also follow that example. It is followed in some European countries, but not in all. It is very much an institute which also creates advocacy for children's rights in its own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just one other question to you. One other question to you. Do girls matter in your international development cooperation policy? Well, sitting here, <laughs> at least girls do matter uh, in our foreign policy. They matter in our uh, development policy. They matter in our SRHR program. We do have in Ethiopia and other African countries, we do have projects aimed at menstrual hygiene at schools, aimed at safe spaces at schools for girls. So girls can go to school and don't have to be outside of the school one week each month or even earlier, we are projects ending child marriage. We are supporting, big supporter of PLAN, to be frank. And also advocacy, child rights, and especially girls' rights is at the heart of our policy. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Now, we, we come to you um, with Dr. Haragoyen. Um, is, is, is gender inequality a problem in this country? And and, uh, and is it the government's fault or whose fault is it? Okay. Yeah. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, African uh, Child Policy Forum for inviting uh, Minister of Science and Higher Education. And it's really an honor to be here to represent Her Excellency Professor Hirut Waldemareb. She's abroad, but. Uh, just joining you in this remarkable uh, report launching. Uh, it matters a lot to, to higher education, uh, too. Having said this, gender inequality, uh, not only a problem, but a very serious problem for this country. In fact, uh, we have ratified almost all gender-related policies. We have developed and improved our policy framework uh, just to promote gender uh, equalities in the country. But, uh, you know, the status of women and girls in Ethiopia is really uh, curtailed when you look at empowerment, education, and when you look at gender-based uh, violence and uh, uh, employment opportunity. Uh, I think it's good to look at uh, some important figures related to uh, education. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, one in every child uh, get the chance to enroll to uh, the uh, secondary education. At the primary level, uh, I think we are successful. But when it comes to the secondary education, uh, I think 
uh, most of our girl students uh, drop out of schools for a number of reasons. And again, um, from these, only 10% of secondary school aged uh, students or girls, female uh, students, enroll in colleges and universities. And this is uh, from Education Abstract uh, Annual 2018, a recent figure, not uh, too far. Again, if you look at uh, the share of female prospective graduates uh, in the previous year, uh, we can find only 38%. And it's not only for the girl students. The disparity uh, is also reflected with the female academics. We'll find only 80% of the academic staff are females. So it's very clear, it's not only this, related to gender violence, the problem uh, not only increasing, but it has become very severe from time to time. And this time, we can see about 49% of Ethiopian women have been experiencing physical violence. And again, 59% of Ethiopian women have suffered from sexual violence. So it's really very frustrating. Even though we are taking a number of initiatives, still, still we have uh, this uh, problem. Related to opportunity for employment, again, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, when women are employed, obviously, uh, to uh, hold job externally with uh, poor pay, and 40% of Ethiopian women are, uh, I think, employed uh, with low-paying service sector. You know, so uh, obviously the problem is very uh, significant. Who's <laughs> Who's responsible is it? I think gender inequality is a socio-cultural as well as political problem. Both the society as well as the government are responsible for this. But in my view, the government should take the lion's share and the government should be more responsible for that. And simply ratifying the conventions, uh, developing and reviewing the policies might not be sufficient. We need to look more other ways of tackling the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another okay. question for you. I have another question for you. you, you you're quite right. I think the, stati the statistics in terms of, uh, uh, of, of gender uh, in secondary school education and university school yeah. is, is, a, is, a, is embarrassing. Mm. Quite frankly, it's, mm. it's sad. But, but I have another question, and that is that well, the quality of education is very poor in any case. Yeah. So what does it really matter whether one goes to high school or university or not? Oh, well, when you talk about the quality of education, uh, obviously it's connected with uh, lots of variables. And uh, one and, uh, most important is that having very uh, quality curriculum is very much important, the education system. And the quality teachers should be there. And the infrastructure should be, you know, we do have very beautiful uh, policies related to education. You could look at the sector development programs. They are very much interesting. When we come to the implementation, we do have lots of problems, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we cannot think about quality education without quality teacher, and quality teachers cannot be you know, found without very supporting working environment, incentives, and the likes. Uh, so they are interrelated. Uh, problems, I think. But let, let me ask you one final question, yeah. and I wouldn't bother you. Let's admit it, Dr. Haragoy, education is a, has become political in this country. Obviously. 
What the government is interested in is ensuring that we have fantastic st statistical achievements, fantastic enrollment mm -hmm. at every level. So many universities, let's say from the days of Haile Selassie where you had only one or two universities, now we have 100 universities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you really serious? Yeah, oh, we have about eight universities in 2000. For now, we have got uh, 50 public universities. You're right. We have got a very significant expansion in the number of universities, but still, we do have a problem with the quality of education offered in these universities. Uh, obviously, the government should work on it. Uh, how? It begins with a review of the curriculum, and uh, the Minister of Science and Higher Education uh, has got only about 10 months uh, it is established, uh, separated from Minister of Education last year. And now we are working on a number of reforms. Among these reforms, thinking about the quality of education, we are trying to differentiate the universities in the area of specialization. Uh, so not only differentiating and uh, reviewing the programs themselves, because unless we are uh, able to produce competent graduates, it has no any advantage just to have a number of graduates every year. So it doesn't make any sense to the development of the country. So we are working on that. And one of the aspects is that just considering the gender perspective in higher education. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Professor Julia Sloth Nelson. Julia. Now, you, you don't want to treat us like your students, okay? In other words, you should speak to us in a very plain language. No academic jargon. Tell me, Julia, what do you think are the most, the most important challenges we should address in terms of legal reform and access to justice for girls in Africa? Thank you. I, I think... As is probably well known, there's been some progress in drafting gender-neutral children's laws, laws relating to gender-based violence, uh, improved trafficking uh, legislation. Some places have got revised family law codes which are more gender-neutral. But clearly there needs to be a complete audit. And secondly, the laws need to be implemented. Um, they need to be implemented not only in the capital city, they need to be implemented in the regions, in the counties, in the provinces, um, and in the deep rural areas too. Where laws provide for implementing provisions, which in academia we call regulations, to say exactly how things must happen, who must respond, by when, we find that oftentimes the children's law is developed and the regulations are not there. They remain to be written. Right. So the law is not going to be effective because it's not clear who must do what. And then when the law set up specialised services and uh, structures and institutions to um, respond to allegations of, for instance, violence, there has been some progress. We have, in many countries, specialised family and child units in the police. We have some specialised uh, units responding to uh, reports of sexual violence, taking the necessary uh, medical uh, information and so forth. But again, it's not everywhere. It's not sustained. They are often vulnerable to funding cuts. They are vulnerable to changes in policies. And so we, we make very halting progress. Wow, but you have opened a Pandora's box, haven't you? At the moment you talk about implementation and enforcement, that's a huge, huge challenge almost throughout Africa, isn't it? It is. It, it's got a number of facets to, to it, as you at the African Child Policy Forum know very well because of the reports that you have produced 
in the past on African child well-being, where you've been looking at this. And it depends on uh, political will. It depends on uh, consistency in policies, not just flip-flopping from this thing to the next between different governments and different regimes. It depends on training and more training and more training mm. and on sustaining the capacity of the sectors, whether it's education, whether it's medical, whether it's uh, law enforcement, sustaining their capacity to carry the project forward. I was interested in my, my colleague's mention of 60 years. Um, it seems from where I sit, I've been working in this field for 30 years, it seems that we might need a bit more than 60 years to make the kind of sustained progress that you can actually talk um, about a whole country um, instead of just a project or a few instances um, of specialization. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, <laughs> Julia has an encyclopedic knowledge of the law, but, uh, but time is short, so we'd, we'd skip for the moment. We may have to come back uh, again. Now, my friend Daniel Bakala, for uh, your director of the Africa program of Ch Human Rights Watch, and then you worked for, for Amnesty, so you know the human rights landscape uh, in Africa as well as anybody else possibly do. What do you think? Why is that? We're some 60, 70 years after colonialism and after the arrival of the political kingdom. Why is it that we are where we are in terms of human rights? Uh, th thank you, Asafa, and uh, let me first congratulate uh, both uh, ACPF and Plan International on the launch of your report, and I'm, I'm also pleased to note that there is a specific case study on Ethiopia, uh, and I look forward to working with uh, both Plan and uh, ACPF, as, as Anne Bridge uh, was saying, to break it down into actionable points and uh, work, uh, work towards uh, the reform of uh, relevant laws and policies in Ethiopia. Uh, and coming to your question, uh, the human rights challenge in Africa is uh, pretty complicated uh, and compounded by a lot of uh, social, political, and economic factors. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, while we do recognize the, the impact of the social and economic factors uh, contributing to the uh, human rights uh, crisis in Africa, I think largely the human rights crisis in Africa is, uh, is a product of the political crisis in Africa. Uh, Africa has not been able to uh, fix its political uh, problems, uh, particularly the, the internal uh, governance systems and uh, the resolution of internal political issues and the governance issues has been a subject of controversy uh, for many, many years, uh, uh, despite coming out of the colonial time, as you uh, noted, Asafa. Uh, so I guess, you know, the, the, the failure to resolve the, the political issues and the political disputes uh, has led into violent conflicts and the violent conflicts uh, in the context in which perhaps the most severe human rights abuses happen in a context of violent conflict uh, from, from large number of killings to huge number of displacement uh, um, to uh, uh, you know the, the political uh, uh, crisis led abuses and violations in a country are largely a product of the, the political crisis in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, but I have one other uh, question for you. It may be a bit too sensitive for you, Dr. Daniel, but I think it has to be asked. Okay, you have this wealth. You are a prisoner yourself. You had this wealth of experience at uh, Human Rights Watch uh, and Amnesty. Now you come to this country where everything is topsy-turvy. Um, 
uh, I don't know how to put it, so let me put it generously, it's a very challenging political uh, environment where you have this seeming conflict or tension, perhaps, between the demands of the rule of law, which probably would mean the exercise of authority on one side. On the other hand, to take the risks associated with a, with a very open and soft approach. How do you think we can maneuver through this kind of crisis, this challenge, to ensure that we have the observance, no, the promotion of human rights and the observance of human rights in a challenging political environment. How do you see yourself maneuvering through? Is that a fair question? Uh, uh, yeah, fair point to raise and uh, not there is not necessarily uh, an easy answer to it, Asaf. I, be, as, as I said, you know, the human rights challenge in, uh, in Africa and in our own Ethiopia is, uh, is a deep-rooted one and a complicated one, and it really requires a long-term perspective and a long-term uh, vision. Uh, we just need to make sure that we persist uh, on the human rights cause, we persist on the human rights agenda, uh, and we persist on the human rights work uh, if we are to make a change over a long term. But I think we should have, uh, uh, you know, an expectation that many of these deep-rooted uh, human rights problems uh, are, uh, are going to go away in a short time frame. So it really requires uh, a long-term work. But it does seem to me that, you know, among a number of other things, it's very important uh, to focus on uh, perhaps one uh, on a massive human rights education program in a country like Ethiopia where uh, we see problems around uh, you know, lack of respect for human dignity uh, and for a lot of Ethiopians and, uh, and Ethiopian observers, uh, perhaps the uh, most recent incidents in Ethiopia seems to be very uh, shocking, uh, the, the extent of the brutality we have seen in some of the human rights crises. So it, um, it makes you think whether or not uh, we have proper uh, social fabrics uh, for acknowledging and recognizing human dignity, which is at the heart of uh, what human rights all mean. So, you know, we need a culture of human rights, which means uh, a, a huge program of awareness and campaign and, uh, and education. Uh, and then I think it's also equally important that we press on accountability. Uh, we don't seem to take accountability very seriously in, uh, in Africa and in Ethiopia as well. Uh, and, and that lack of accountability seems to continue a culture of abuse and a culture of impunity uh, in the country. So I think we need to press uh, strongly on holding perpetrators to account. Uh, and we, um, you know, sometimes when we seem to be taking measures in, in the name of accountability, uh, we seem to be going after the small fish and we let the big fish to continue to swim uh, freely in a culture of impunity. So it's very important that there, there's got to be a strategic approach to pressing on questions of uh, accountability. And perhaps the third point is the importance of building institutions. You know, in countries uh, where there is a better protection of uh, uh, human rights, it's because they have institutions to enforce and protect rights. Uh, and, and I hope, you know, in, uh, in Ethiopia what we need to be doing uh, is building those kind of institutions that would be the vanguards of uh, uh, human rights protection. Thank you very much. That was good, wasn't it? That was good, blunt talk. I like that myself. One final question to you. We're talking about girls. My question to you is, do girls deserve a special attention in your human rights work or not? Oh, and absolutely. So what are you yeah. planning to do about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, I mean, one of probably the top human rights issues in, in Ethiopia is women's rights and uh, child rights issues, which includes uh, girls' rights. 
uh, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, in addressing uh, a lot of uh, uh, systemic, structural causes uh, of uh, abuses on girls and children in general. Uh, and I, I'd be very keen, as I mentioned, to, to, to look at your findings and recommendations. Uh, but from uh, my perspective, you know, there's no question that women's rights and child rights issues uh, will continue to be one of the big priorities. And if I would think of one, uh, one issue that we probably need to be prioritizing when it comes to African girls, Ethiopian girls, or probably a bit more broadly, on, uh, uh, on, on African children and Ethiopian children is the need to end child hunger, which seems to be uh, a persistent problem, uh, but is also a massive shame for all of us that we, uh, we continue to let our children to starve. So I think, you know, if, if we would prioritize, I would really urge that we find a way to, to end child hunger. And that seems to me is within our means, and, uh, and there, is, there should be a way to do this in a sustainable way without necessarily relying on a non-sustainable external support. And if I may, Asafa, uh, allow me to, to suggest one idea which I think like we should be doing in maybe in Ethiopia, uh, but not only in Ethiopia, but, uh, but maybe across Africa as well, uh, as a way of finding a solution to something uh, like you know, the, 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 uh, some of the issues that your own center has been working on about uh, a school feeding program. You know? mm -hmm. If we needed to respond a way of ending child hunger, one example of it seems to me is really implementing a genuine, dedicated, committed uh, school feeding program. And the way I think about it, a school feeding program is in our means. If we simply take uh, the lottery money in Africa, uh, the lottery money seems to me is, is a money should, that should not belong in the coffers of government. The lottery money in Africa can definitely sustain and uh, uh, feed uh, children in school. So, I mean, if we can do something like uh, an Africa-wide advocacy campaign to take lottery money from government to use it for, uh, to, to, to finance a school feeding program, and if we can start that campaign from Ethiopia and we can take lottery money uh, you know, like if we use it for such a social cause, I see a potential we can double it and triple it and can be a sustainable source to, uh, to fund uh, kids going to school who should not be hungry. So I think, you know, that I would really like to take that as an advocacy challenge for groups working on this issue, uh, that maybe it can also be a continent-wide advocacy campaign. Lottery Latamari. Wow, we do have a man of substance here, don't we? I think he deserves an applause again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniel Bakala. My good friend, Yetna Bush. Um, I, 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 I need hardly say that uh, you, are, uh, you are someone uh, uh, who who is, uh, who is uh, the perfect example of man or woman prevailing on circumstances in many, many ways. You come from an exceptionally impressive and challenged background. Would you be able to tell us what it means to be a woman in Ethiopia? <laughs> Thank you. And I think that's not an easy question, right? <laughs> so I would also like to start by congratulating Boz Plan and uh, ACPF for this amazing report, which I am proud to say that it also contains elements on inclusion. So I'm so proud to say that both ACPF and Plan do share the inclusive channel, the inclusive path. So 
I think it's a perfect marriage of partnership. Uh, to be uh, fair to this question, I think to be a woman in Ethiopia would have different faces because Ethiopian women are quite different, resilient, and uh, challenged in a number of ways. And I love the topic getting girls equal because being, girl, being a girl is something that I have been once upon a time and I wish if I can be again. And it's something that my, the majority of my house is. I've got three girls who uh, at one point will be 10 women. So getting girls equal is so sounding. So being a woman in Ethiopia would give you a number of opportunities and challenges. However, it's also important to understand that there is a huge point of intersectionality in being a woman in Ethiopia. Ethiopian women are rural women. Ethiopian women are pastoralist women. Ethiopian women are saving women. Ethiopian women are internally displaced women, especially at this point in time. So being Ethiopian women is, of course, an opportunity, and in the meantime, a challenge. But something very important I want to highlight is the fact that there are a number of intersectionality between being a woman, being a poor woman, being a woman or a girl with a disability, being a girl or a woman with, with HIV AIDS, or whatever sorts of layer we put it, the intersectionality is something very vibrant that we cannot avoid to continue ignoring. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Yetna Bush, basically what you're saying is that we should look at women in, in context, we have to look at the context within which they exist. But let me ask you one other question. Um, you, are, you have thought about many of these, uh, many of these issues uh, in various capacities. You know, you are the executive director of the Ethiopian Center on Disability and Development. Uh, you have been working in international NGOs. Uh, and now you are working with the Peace Commission. But let's, let me just give you this opportunity that you have a magic wand. If you had that magic wand, what would be the one or two things that you will do to change the conditions of girls in Ethiopia? <sighs> I think what I have noticed, especially growing and coming into different assignments, even though voluntarily, is that it's always difficult to exercise power, right? Especially uh, recently. So the magic wound that I would uh, do to change the condition of girls in Ethiopia is definitely going to be very difficult because Ethiopian girls do face multiple problems still. And I was witnessing just last week, a girl was raped and killed here in Addis, around Yeka Mikael area. And we're all quiet about it. And I happen to be also in South Africa when that girl who, who was raped and killed by the post office, just behind the post office, by the post office guy, all the women were out. So I feel like my Ethiopia is a country that you're not allowed even to cry while somebody pinches you. So I feel heavy hurt about the silence that we are entertaining in this country when it comes into girls' issue. And of course, most of you know about the host, Ethiopian Airlines hostess who had entertained the same, who, have, who passed away the same way, being raped and killed here in Addis, nor anywhere else. So, like in South Africa, women were really, really vibrant. They were vocal. It was during the World Economic Forum um, in Cape Town, Julia's town also. 
And uh, women were out. They didn't seek any permission to cry. But we, I, I talked to some women activists and lead women organizations because it's difficult to lead those kind of activisms when you are a reconciliation commissioner. So I asked, I asked them and then they told me, well, we had to ask permission and uh, the government is not happy that we can do this kind of things. So um, I would think the fact that we are very quiet about things and we are very submissive about things is that we don't have the right equipment. We're not equipped enough to say no to things that we said no for. So I would give the no 101, which is education, quality, and inclusive education. Thank you. <laughs> now we're coming to the, almost the end of our, of our, uh, uh, of our uh, event. Um, I'd like to give the panelists uh, uh, I'd like to give you the, the chance to say the last word, if, uh, if, if I may. Um, I, I'm, I'm like, I, I think this time I'd like to start with the other question, then I'll end up with uh, Anne-Virgine. So, yes, my question, your last word, please. Thank you so much. I just want to reflect on two things on Gazan's question. What should the next theme of children advo child rights advocacy should be? I think, for me, I would say, keep your promise. I think we're so tired of new promises. We really want to get stuck to the old promises, and we really want to see them done. I want to come back to Wesson's reflection on the relevance of, of education. I do feel that um, it's not about simply educating, but it's about what we are educating. Because in the past decades here in Ethiopia, I was talking with my cousin, wh who lives in another region, and what she has learned completely is different from what, what I have learned. So the what matters. On the last piece of investing in education, ambassador, the Seashells, the Paradise Ambassador, I just really feel the same and I would invite you to see the research that my organization, Light for the World, has done investing in education. And that's true, they don't want to invest in education. I, don't, I didn't do any research, but our research shows that it's, especially for inclusive education, investment is quite, quite, quite low in Africa. I would assume that part of the reason is that like children with disabilities, in particular girls with disabilities, are presumed to be less worthy teaching. However, I do feel, I have a gut feeling that most of our leaders who are empowered today did not come through the path of education. They have come through the path of guns. So somebody pays more for something that he or she has exercised or witnessed, tasted. So had they tasted education, I think they would know the price. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yetima Bresh. <laughs> Dr. Daniel, please. Uh, thank you. On, on the point about the importance of human rights education, I could not agree more, uh, including on the point of integrating human rights education into the uh, mainstream education system. But at the same time, I also like to see us find a new and innovative ways of doing human rights education. So I would, I would really encourage if anyone has any thoughts about how better and how effectively we can do human rights education in Ethiopia, please, please do come to the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, you know, not only on this idea, but on a number of other issues. Uh, if there are some thoughts on uh, how we could do better on a lot of issues, uh, please do come to the commission and I look forward to working with, uh, with, with anyone interested to work on these issues. I think I felt the same way on the issue on Gazain's point about a team. I felt the same way like, you know, I, I, Gazain, I see your point about the importance of having a team to galvanize our work, uh, but I also get concerned about jumping from one team to another team before we achieve uh, what we set out to achieve with the various teams. And I wish uh, this is also a way of focusing at uh, the, the, the goals uh, achieved in the teams. And, and in my view, like I said, you know, uh, I wish uh, we achieve uh, the, the goal of ending child hunger, and I wish we achieve, we find a way of uh, uh, sustainably funding a school feeding program before we move to other teams. Uh, and we have a, a, a Dutch friend here. In Netherlands, they have this uh, lottery program called the Postcode Lottery, 
which is a very fascinating uh, uh, way of lottery system. And they, they raise tons of money every year. And, and the Dutch use that money they raise from the lottery to fund projects in Africa, Asia, all over the world, you know. They, they fund development projects with the lottery money they raised in, in Netherlands. And we have the postcode lottery money in other places. But the one in Dutch is also one of the big ones. And it just breaks my heart that the Europeans use the lottery money to fund projects in our countries. And we have African governments that use gambling to raise money and feed government coffers. So if you really want a team, I want us to work on a team of like lottery money for like for school feeding, for for such a social cause, you know. And this this is this is a money we have to take from government to use for social causes as opposed to uh, being uh, being a money that should go into government <laughs> coffers. So if uh, at the risk of repeating myself. If anyone is interested on working this issue and joining me, Hans, I really want to speak with you uh, because I think this is something within our means and we should be able to achieve it uh, b before we even be begin to move to other uh, teams. There was something else I wanted to say, but it escaped my mind as a fast, so I'll pass it to you. It's okay. Judy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think what I learned out of working on this project was that even when the law uh, looks as if it's sort of equal, that there are people who drop off and that girls are particularly affected. And it's not something that happens when they are very young necessarily, but as we get to the indicators at the end of their childhood at 18, we can see the disparity has grown and grown and grown. And we did follow the idea or the approach of intersectionality, um, of looking at who is likely to be left behind. That was raised by Yetna Bush. Um, I want to turn to the uh, intervention by the ambassador for the Seychelles who talked about education and empowerment. And I want to mention something else which nobody has talked about today, and that is patriarchy. I don't want to talk about custom and tradition. We find patriarchy everywhere. We find it in the leafy suburbs, in the wealthy suburbs of Johannesburg and Cape Town and Nairobi, as much as we find it in the rural areas and in the villages. So along with empowerment of girls, we have to tackle patriarchy because that is what results in girls dropping out of school, in girls being denied access to sexual and reproductive health services, which ultimately limits their life chances because they get married too young, they have children too young, they die too young. So we have to uh, tackle the flip side of the coin of empowerment, which is patriarchy. Thank you. Thank you once again. Um, uh, I think we must uh, walk the, uh, you know, the talk. We're talking a lot. And uh, this is not the time to talk about our policy framework is because we have said a lot. And I, I believe that we have done a lot in that area. What is left is that just putting it into practice. So we have to, everything, every possible way is pointing to education. And especially we in the education sector uh, should take, you know, the point into great consideration. And the first thing, uh, we need to incorporate gender equality in our curricula, starting from the lower grade to the higher education and institutions. And again, we have to work to create safe and comfortable, suitable environment, education environment for the girls, for the children, if we want to have a real, you know, uh, gender equality in this sphere. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Um, before going to this uh, panel, I asked to some woman what I should say and what should be done on the situation in Ethiopia. And one of the answers was also educate the men that harass the women and discriminate against women. 
And I agree completely with Professor Julia at saying patriarchism, but also the man. And in this room, we see some girls. And I hope in future we also see boys at this kind of panels, because I guess it's not a girl's problem. It's a problem of boys and girls together. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Asefer. And, and since I do have the, the, the final word, let me just say the things that I, I do want to say um, also publicly in terms of thanks to ACPF, USF, personally to Violet and the work that you and your team have done to the government of Netherlands for, uh, for funding this, um, this work. Um, you know, the, the question around, and it also goes to the question asked by, by, by the young girl, um, what should really be our next campaign? We have come to the conclusion at Plan International that despite all the good work, despite the good laws, despite you know, progress in girls' education, um, despite better health services, despite many, many good things, we are not moving the needle on rights uh, fast enough. And at the heart of it was exactly what was mentioned further down the road, both patriarchy as well as the harmful norms um, and, and practices. So the only campaign that matters for us right now is to make sure that in every corner, not just of Africa, but all over the world, um, the girl child is equally seen, heard, and valued from birth, in her family, in school, in communities, in the workplace, everywhere. Because there is no place in the world, actually, not even in my own home country, Denmark, that often ranks very high on lists where there is true gender equality. This is not an African problem. But when we do look at the statistics in Africa, there are some considerable challenges. And when a girl child is not valued, seen, and heard, when she is not given the choice to consent or not to consent, but her body is violated on a daily basis, when she doesn't even have the basic information to how to say no, how to navigate power, how to protect herself, um, how to get access to services, and those services are barred to her because her body and her actions are being criminalized, then we have a problem. Um, and that, for me, is, is at the end of the day, if, we, if, if a girl's no is not a no, then, then we can argue from now to kingdom come about all the things we argued about in Nairobi or other things or in other meetings of the AU, etc. And we won't actually be fulfilling what Africa itself has said it values, which is an Africa whose development is people-driven, that also means girl-driven, relying on the potential offered by people, especially its women, youth, and children. That is what Africa itself has said that it values. And so let's make sure that at every time, yes, we should fix these discriminatory laws that this report says, and yes, we should drive their implementation. But the only way to get real traction is to put the girl's child at the center. And I want to therefore also finish with sort of a formal sort of launch and explanation also of the title, Getting Girls Equal. Because also Plan International's global campaign, Girls Get Equal, is all about making sure that every girl um, is equally seen, heard, and value, because that is the heart of everything that is missing in terms of gender equality on all continents. Thank you, Asefa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avery. That's, that's, that is uh, that's a, f a fantastic conclusion to a very interesting. Uh, Sam, can you please come? Sam Noga, please. It's now your turn. Uh, to do what you need to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Sefer. 
Um, I mean, normally on a Friday evening um, around this time, we probably would not be sitting here for three hours. We probably will be sitting um, either home um, with our friends, maybe with um, a glass. But despite all of and I can see people nodding, so I'm actually telling the truth. Um, so, Excellencies, distinguished panelists, our friends, um, I can see many of them here. I would like to say a big thank you. Um, we called you, you acknowledged, and you said you would come, and you actually did come. So thank you very much for sitting through and for making sure that you are part of this historic event. I think a lot has been said, and um, almost everything that is said here is what needs to be done. But somebody needs to do it. And the question is, who is going to do it? I think it will take all of us, probably not doing the ordinary, because the ordinary hasn't helped us. Maybe what we need to do is the extraordinary. And the extraordinary can be done by the extraordinary people who defiled a Friday afternoon, the traffic, everything else, to be here. And so this is my challenge. Um, and as I thank all of you, and as I call AB, to launch the report officially. Yeah, I've already done that. You've done? Yeah. Let, let them, let them, let okay, them go. Just hold it and say, yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it's to say, uh, we have Agenda 2063, we have 2040, we have CLC, it's 30 years, probably older than all the young ladies over there. We have the African Charter, which is going to be 30 years next year. The question is, what are we doing? to make sure that the world, this planet we live on, is safe, not just safe, safer, not just safer, but probably the safest place for our girls to be able to sit, to be able to relax, to be able to talk about the things they want to talk about. They are our girls, they are our daughters, they are our sisters, they are our nieces, our mothers, they get violated every day. And I would want to challenge each one of us to go back, read the report, and then tell yourself what you think you want to do to make the world a safer place for our girls. Thank you very much for coming. And Abby, I have the pleasure of inviting you to... To launch. To launch. You launch it. You do it. I don't, I don't, I don't care. It's okay. Okay, I've been asked to uh, launch the report. The report is launched. So... <laughs> Now we might have to do something. Yeah, you go do that.